Hello everybody, this is Avantik here. We will today discuss activation functions. Activation function played a major role in uh, advancement of neural networks. Okay. Uh, the purpose of activation func function is to enable neural networks to converge. What I mean by that is to reduce a loss. Uh, that is the ulterior motive of neural networks, right? Well, what it does, just to recap whatever we have discussed earlier, uh, with every uh, epoch, with every you know iteration, what it tries to do is it tries to minimize the loss, and in doing so, it tries to find uh, or fine tune the model parameters further. Okay, so that's the objective. That's how it does this. In doing so, a lot of uh, you know research has happened, and people realized after uh, you know certain failure and before they could found off activation function that it's not converging. So activation function enabled neural networks to converge, thus get to the results quickly. So of course, if you use different activation function, you are getting different convergence rate or different results. Let's not try to understand. At least compare between Sigmund and Relu. Uh, okay, and how do they help us converging the neural networks? Let's get started. So here, let's first understand what is the sigmoid function and relu function. Sigmoid function, uh, given a particular data, it tries to bring it between, uh, you know, you can see here between 0 and 1. That is the ulterior objective. You pass some data to this and it will make the data tending to 0 or tending to 1, right, uh, given particular data. What does relu function do? Given a particular data, it will uh, convert that into 0 or max. Like if the number is less than 0, it will make it 0. If it is uh, more than 0, whatever the number is, that will be there. Okay. Uh, important thing to understand here is there is no really uh, computational mathematical proof okay, which tells why relu is better. But it is from a lot of experiments that people have realized that relu is performing a lot better and we will see this in, in our experiment right away. Okay. If what we have is uh, uh, MNIST data and as always we are loading the Keras data set for MNIST and on importing this it is importing it from uh, the inbuilt data set. We divide the data into train and test. This is done with MNIST.load data function. This is the train data. This is the test data. Okay. As you can see train data consists of 60,000 samples of MNIST data. Just to recap in case you know you haven't visited the earlier videos, MNIST is handwriting numerical data. Okay. Handwriting data. What you have is, this is 60,000 samples of training data. Each image is represented in, in dimension of 28 cross 28. Okay, so this is your uh, training data. This is your test data. So we have 10,000 test samples. Again, each image is 28 cross 28, right? I think we understand the data set now. Okay, a uh, few import here. Okay, like sequential, dense, to call back, call back. As we proceed further, we'll understand uh, when to use what. But these are the necessary imports that is required here. And you can see y val shape. This is target information. As we understand in MNIST data, target will be between 0 and 9. Okay. The first thing that we need to do with image data like MNIST is to normalize it. That means whatever data is there, then it will pixel size, pixel value, right? It will be between 0 to 255. We'll try to divide it by 255 so that the value comes between 0 and 1. As you can see here, we are dividing the data by 255. So all the pixel values is now converted between 0 and 1. Okay. After normalizing the data, what is the next thing is one hot encode of the labels. The labels are values from 0 to 9, right? And each of these va values need to be converted into a vector okay say for example you have one to be represented in vector format you will represent that zero one followed by eight zeros right in the vector format similarly if you have to represent three it will be zero 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 one followed by rest of the zeros so this is the vector format representation of three similarly what is this two categorical function is doing it's converting all the data to a vector format like this Okay, and that is why you see the shape here. Okay, 60,000 and each is represented by a vector of 10. Okay, this is the output. Now, we need to flatten the data. That means uh, the data which was earlier represented as 28 cross 28, we need to flatten it out. That means now it will be represented in a vector format, row vector format and the size of will be 784. As you can see this here. Okay, so you are converting the train data and the uh, uh, target information into this uh, format okay this is your train data this is your test data you are converting into data of size 784 uh, vector okay this is the information now what we intend to do is we intend to create a 
uh, our network okay uh, this is this is we want to create using sequential that means we are we will be configuring layer by layer all of them the first layer consists of the input layer of course the number of units in the input layer will be equivalent to number of inputs in the pixel that is 784 that is why you see this input dimension is equal to 784 the activation we function that we want to use in this case is sigmoid okay the activation function is acting on each uh, unit okay each unit is each unit gets data from uh, edges right okay and based on the computation it will apply the uh, uh, sigmoid function in this example later on we will apply renu function here for ex in this case what will it do depending on the value it will convert the resultant into uh, between 0 and 1 which will be feeding to the next layer right since we are applying sigmoid here so as you can see we are applying the sigmoid in each of our in uh, you know layer uh, hidden layers and the output we have softmax i'll come to that okay so first layer consists of your 700 uh, i mean after input layer the first hidden layer consists of 700 units here the next layer consists of 350 units here and the following layer consists of 100 units here and the last layer consists of 10 units here now the question is why is the last layer 10 as well as why are the middle layers these values okay uh, middle layer of course has these values and that is what you do as a you know programmer you find the optimized number of units and number of layers in the middle layer the last layer is decided based on the number of classes that you want to identify in this case you have 0 to 9 that is 10 classes that is why your last layer has 10 and this is the multi-class classification so you will be using a softmax over here okay so uh, sigmoid is there in all the hidden layers of course you can have different uh, activ activation function as well you can use really well as well but usually you'll have same activation function across all the hidden layers okay after you have done with the creation of the model part the next thing that you are doing is you're 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 uh, passing the loss function calculator so it is categorical cross entropy in this case you're passing the you're telling what type of optimizer it is using and the um, you know matrices which helps it identifying the loss with every run okay the categorical cross entropy this is the function uh, that will be used internally to find the loss this is the optimizer which uses this loss function to fine tune the model parameters and this accuracy tells you how accurate is the model okay so these are your uh, mod, uh, configuration parameter for this particular uh, model so in kiras that's how you actually externally configure the model okay after you have done all this the next thing that you do is you need to see the model here so that is what we are doing model name dot summary it is actually showing you all the details including total number of hidden uh, you know total number of parameters here it, the maths is really simple doing it here okay 700 and the number of so how do you get to these numbers it is a d dense layer here so the number of units in the next layer uh, cross number of units in the previous layer plus one so use if you do the maths you'll get this guy okay um, then what you need to do you are we are mentioning the number of epochs uh, you are mentioning the number of batches and the validation split so what is the number of epochs here how many uh, so we have a batch size of 256 that means we'll take 256 data okay and uh, uh, using that 256 data from this samples that means 256 images you are using and the values corresponding to it will compute the loss okay on computing the loss uh, what you're doing is you are uh, trying to fine tune the model parameters after this is the first epoch so what is the total number epoch 10 so every every time you're taking a random 256 data running one epoch computing the loss modifying the model parameters and you do this again and again till 10 times and this is the you know result that we see after 10 iterations using sigmoid so this is the accuracy we start with 10 percent and we improve uh, pretty much you know around 10.77 or 10.6 to 10.77 which is not a good convergence that we see in case of sigmoid function we try to improve this we try to do this using relu having keeping all the number of layers and the unit same in this case we just replace the activation function as relu pretty much everything is same here and what we observe here is the convergence so it starts with 81 percent then the first try itself it reached from you know 0 to 81 percent and with 10 iterating it is pretty close to 92 percent which is amazing and what we see is you know relu is way way better than sigmoid okay so i think this gives us an understanding uh, you know what is activation function and why does it matter first activation factor helps in convergence convergence helps us you know uh, getting to uh, solve problems using neural networks okay so definitely relu was an amazing find okay thank you that's for that's all for this session we'll catch up in the next one rest of the stuff thank you